Cheers, thank you for having me. And uh, thanks for joining me today. I love talking about visualizing narrative media. And my first job is gonna be to tell you what that means. <laughs> All right, so uh, story structure in games and comics, visualizing narrative media. Um, what I mean by that is I mean, how do we answer the question, what are the shapes of stories in different narrative media forms? So this is a long-standing question in the narrative arts, um, from the plot arcs of novels and the rhyme schemes of poems to shot sequences in films. Um, we're actually quite used to studying uh, the structure, uh, the chapters and the paragraphs, the passages, the couplets and the stanzas of uh, different media forms. But here we're gonna be looking at uh, digital humanities and data-driven and information visualization-driven approaches uh, to two media forms that people may not be used to thinking of in terms of studying their structures. Uh, you might have ABAB'd a poem in high school or maybe drawn a plot arc uh, with a climax and a resolution, um, uh, but you probably didn't actually analyze a collection of video games or comics in terms of their story structure. So when I say this is an old question, I want us to think about two kinds of points of reference, um, which for a long time have been uh, widespread in our like, high school level public education system. One is plot arc diagrams. So we have here the introduction, rise, climax, return or fall, uh, catastrophe, there could be a denouement. Um, uh, this is Freytag's Pyramid. It's uh, quite old, developed it in 1863. Um, but we also have uh, uh, an example of Kurt Vonnegut giving a public lecture, uh, much like this one, sort of research ideas worth thinking about, um, where he was drawing uh, Cinderella or Oedipus Rex uh, onto, gra onto a graph. It looks like information visualization of narrative. Uh, our second example, rhyme scheme analysis in poetry. Um, we may be very familiar with um, A, B, A, B, B, A, B, A, C, D, D, et cetera, um, which then gives us different structures which we might name. That's a sonnet, we'd say. Not based on anything it's about, but purely based on its structure. Right? So I'm gonna start with one of two projects. The first is looking at the micro level, at the individual units of narrative media. And we're gonna be talking about panel code. Uh, for encoding the page space of a graphic narrative. It's a minimal markup language uh, that I developed for describing visual compositions as abstract layouts. And there's tooling involved. Uh, you can uh, code it where it renders live on a web page, you can um, edit it while you type, you can add annotations, so on and so forth. Um, uh, there's uh, documentation, and uh, you'll see as you sort of uh, dive into what it can be applied to that it's been developed not for uh, comic books specifically, um, but for newspaper cartoons, magazines, web webtoons, manga, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're thinking really expansively about what juxtaposed images can do narratively, and then asking if we describe them structurally, what will we need to be able to accommodate to describe most of them at an approximate structural level. Uh, so there's a lot of data encoded about comics, digital and print, uh, in our contemporary world. And one of the um, most common ways to do it is to define a rectangular box somewhere on the surface of the comic pixelated image and say, here, there's a panel here from 1025 to 5075, or this is a speech balloon, or this is a person's face. Uh, we're very good at these kinds of um, broad uh, annotative systems where we layer coordinates onto image. We can do the same thing that Google Maps might do, or we could do the same thing that a, um, a, a car computer vision system might do. This is a pedestrian, et cetera. But instead, we're just annotating boxes on the comics page. It's a computer vision problem. But we're not doing that. <laughs> so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, what kind of page is this? Is it a one? It's got a single panel on it. Is it a three? It's got three tall panels on it in a single row. Uh, is it a three, two, one, where uh, 
we've got a, th a row of three panels, and then a row of two panels, and then a one panel. Right? So we can already see that this descriptive language that I, I, can, I can type it, I can speak it, uh, I can write it really, really fast as I'm flipping through a big archive of hundreds of back issues of uh, Batman or uh, Naruto. Um, and I can start to imagine things like I can do sort operations on this. I can search on this. Show me all of the different pages um, uh, that have these properties. I can map against different forms. I can say this abstract square that's encoded describes a layout that looks like this. And if it had been printed in a newspaper, it would be stretched out like this. And if it had been printed on a comic book page, it would be stretched out like this. But it's the same thing, right? A structural description of form. So uh, when we're developing this concept into a language so that teams of people who are working either with uh, uh, tooling that will scan their favorite webtoons uh, or they're actually just entering panels by hand. They can write the code, they can read the code, they can quickly render the code into a preview that shows these abstract forms, and they can add annotations and labels to it. It looks something like this while it's being written down. Um, as long as we're rendering for the web, we can add uh, CSS styling. So we can uh, preview it in different sizes. We could start to add uh, Qualities to pages that do things like um, show that the page is skewed or rotated or has an unusual shape or has been stretched or runs off the page. And that these are expressive annotations that start to say more and more and more about what the composition looks like while keeping that basic frame that says, um, if we were to subdivide an abstract grid into a set of panels, what is the rhythm of this page as a series of comic elements? Um, what's its rhyme scheme? Now, say we've done all this work. Let's just imagine that we've encoded, and we have not, a few hundred thousand comics in this particular style across genre, form, period, different kinds of publication language, manga and manhwa and European comics and newspaper strips. Great. We're ready to start searching our database and finding the patterns and discovering the forms and asking the questions. Um, uh, the same way we would in other large-scale forms of data analysis. We might call this uh, cultural analytics. But often what people want to do when they're using tooling like this is they don't necessarily want to do big data. They just want to study all the works of their favorite artist. Or they just want to study one collection that came out in a particular year uh, or a series of years. Um, that they want to work with one or 10 or 100 objects, not 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000. Well, annotation is an important place to go next, where you say, well, can we make the data entry system easy enough to where you could, uh, say, for example, just say, well, I want to tag for acts of violence. And now I can encode my work, and every single time an act of violence appears, I'm just going to add a little tag to the panel as I write, and those will all pop up in red. And now I can look at a few hundred pages in a few seconds and see the patterns of violent representation over this particular narrative. Or uh, people passing the Bechdel test. Or interior versus exterior. Or representations of the natural world. Or animals. Uh, or money. Or whatever it is that you care about as a humanities scholar, cultural critic, artist, um, analyst, um, uh, now you can say, well, uh, this isn't just about abstract structures. It provides an abstract structure that we could use for annotation. Right? So now the, que the question when we think about this form of design is now not just um, uh, how can I represent scaling, but how can I represent this in a way that enables people to do research on top of it? who've asked questions that I haven't even anticipated. I don't know what they are. I'm not going to be able to encode everything that's interesting about my data in one pass, but I can create a way that my data wants to be built upon and create tools that enable future researchers to build on it. So um, one of the things I want to point out here, uh, newspapers is an interesting example of a place where our whole assumption that a series of panels has an arrangement may be flawed. 
Historically, newspaper strips, I um, apologize for not providing like a, a Garfield or a Doonesbury here as an example, um, were sent to various papers and were used a particular shingled tiling design that enabled them to be recut and restacked in different ways. Uh, so you can see here that you could stack the same set of panels with or without the optional first panel in this way, this way, this way, or this way, and different papers could choose to run it in different forms. So we're going to need a language that also accommodates flow, um, where we can encode our data, uh, specify uh, page dimensions and the way that it would flow, but also it could be expressed as being able to be reflowed. Um, so this set of encodings here um, uh, might describe that kind of abstract set of panel spaces, but if we added an annotation on saying, oh, but this was all run full page, uh, then we would know how to render it. Um, we can apply this to really large works, and we can do it with the original art. So here's a rendering of the graphic novel Asterius Polyp. Here's more of it, and here's even more of it up close. And you can see that the renderings, um, which include all kinds of different annotations about style, some of which are very, very uh, abstract and some of which are very, very concrete, the renderings are paired with the original art. So you can see what's lost and what's preserved. Um, does something have to be lost? Yes, always. A representation is always going to simplify, and when it does, it's never going to faithfully, fully reenact the original. But we want to find the sweet spot between being expressive enough to ask, what other pages in my data set are like this? Like they have mainly regular panels and then one irregular panel. Can you show me that for other artists? Is that more common in Europe or America? But we also want to be able to do that without making the language so complicated that when people look at it and say, should I do my project in this? They say, oh, nope. It's going to be too hard and take too long. Every page takes like five minutes to type up. No, we want, we want you to be able to enter a page in five to 10 seconds max, three on a good day with practice, right? Um, so this idea also about the representation, what's the ideal level of complexity? Well, make it gradiated. Make a level of representation that can either really look at the way um, sections bleed off the edges of the pages, the relative sizes, um, ratios, or can say, eh, you know, it's really just a two by three. This is a two, two, two. That's it. Um, so can we make something where someone can enter the complex form and then boil it down to the simple form? Yes. Uh, we, we won't go into the detail here and now, um, but this is the kind of important design element that enables people to understand there's no one right encoding of a page, but if you do a deep encoding, you can render a simple encoding from it. Um, that means you can do things like comparison and search really, really well, as opposed to the data that you love the most being so ornamented that it never matches anything else because it's expressed in a different way, right? You want the things that you add the most uh, most information to, to always be simplifiable if you're asking questions about comparison and contrast. Um, so I'm showing another example from this same uh, uh, infamous um, horror manga. <clears throat> and uh, you can see here three different examples of encoding the same work with different kind of visual fidelity. Um, there are some real strange questions here about how the panels operate in the original. They're sort of vertically shingled in a way that's uneasy and makes us not sure where we should read next. Um, that can be completely lost in the simplified form, or we can recreate it if we really, uh, if we really want to. So I'm going to mo uh, move on in the interests of time and just say that this has been an example at the micro level. What we, were, what we were doing when we were asking the question, how can we encode, visualize, and annotate comics media, graphic narrative media, as, was we were asking a design question that was working with the individual layout or composition or page or strip, the unit, like thinking about stanzas or lines of poetry. Now, 
What if, instead, we were thinking about the structure of the whole? So I'm going to share a second project um, that I've worked on with you today, um, the Transverse Reading Project, and it's focusing on developing an atlas of branching narratives. What do I mean by that? I mean any story in which you can choose to go left or right, uh, to agree with the person or to disagree with the person, to fight the dragon or to run away from the dragon, right? Uh, any story that has uh, discrete branching options in it, uh, interactive through game book paper or an amusement park ride or a video game or a hypertext, um, could be in added to this atlas. And that means finding a shared form of representation that can represent an amusement park ride and a choose-your-own-adventure book and a video game. So um, I think we'll just uh, skip past uh, some of the, the wordiness and just focus in on a few of our core case studies. Um, I come out of a background studying interactive narrative forms, originally uh, text-based adventure games, um, such as uh, Zork and the works of Infocom, uh, leading up to the contemporary command line uh, parser. Um, uh, Twine-based hypertext fiction is going to be a focus today. We'll be focusing on uh, available, open source, free, uh, commonly used authoring tools that small independent game developers primarily, and single authors who want to make interactive works, use when they're writing work that they want to publish online. Uh, hypertext fiction, of course, is much, much older than Twine. Um, uh, examples go back uh, decades, um, but there's a lot of work in the 80s, 90s, aughts, and teens. And then game books actually goes back to the late 1920s, early 1930s. So the first works that say, um, uh, if you wish to date Edmund, go to page 72, and if you prefer the Earl of Sussex, go to 35. Um, uh, they were not actually uh, Victorian works, but, they, but the very first was a novel of manners with two boyfriends, the werewolf and the vampire boyfriend, uh, so to speak. Um, consider the consequences. Um, so we have a deep archive of dead tree-based interactive narrative in 14 languages with thousands of examples going back, um, going back um, almost a century now. Um, we could look at amusement park rides. We could talk about interactive cinema, uh, cinemas and um, where you go in and you press buttons and things happen based on audience vote. Um, we could talk about interactive theater, but any place where we're making discrete choices, whether it be a comic book or an interactive DVD or even a, a, a piece of flowchart art, um, we could say this story is shaped like a graph. And some of the genres we're familiar with, every single story is shaped like a graph. There are always only choices, and the choices always go to other pages which exist. Uh, you can start to uh, imagine that there are also hybrid forms, vast video games that you can play for 100 hours that maybe have hundreds of little graphs in them, each graph a conversation with another character, for example, um, or a mini game. Um, but if we think about Twine specifically, uh, it's an online uh, uh, and desktop-based application and has a very rich authoring community that um, authors interactive literature and games in it. Um, you'll notice that one of the things we can do, uh, this old screenshot says uh, about 1,500 uh, Twine games on itch.io. I think it's closer to six or 7,000 now, uh, if I recall correctly. Um, but one of the things that you can do is you can actually download thousands and thousands of these games and then run automatic data extraction algorithms on their contents, JavaScript and HTML at this point, to say, okay, what's the shape of all the choices inside? Now, when people are authoring these games, they're actually using a corkboard-like interface um, to create an interactive story. Tools like this are used um, uh, all the way up and down the chain into really big game development platforms um, where they manage uh, 
uh, plot, variable tracking, uh, conversation, all the way down um, uh, to independent works in which someone is working in an application where it's like they're designing their entire interactive story on a cork board or a, like a conspiracy theorist. And when we take one of these works and we extract it, we get something like this in our renderer. Uh, this is the uh, depression quest. You can notice some really strange uh, and interesting things about it, such as these really large sets of parallel choices that expand and then contract and expand and then contract. And these places where lots of choices all sweep forward past optional material uh, to a choke point. This is an alternate representation of that same work using something that looks like a periodic table of elements. Uh, we, have a, we have a node with an ending or a beginning, uh, a link that goes in or comes out, and we can say, well, how many nodes are there in Depression Quest where there's only one way to get there and you only get two choices? How about three? Uh, and we could start imagining a kind of a chemical analysis of networks that relates to the constituent components of stories where we're asking again the question, how do all of these interactive works Interactive storytelling is over a century old, even if you don't count the, um, uh, the non-structured forms of you know, uh, participatory cinema and uh, bedtime stories. Right? So uh, what are they made of? How are they shaped? What do they look like? Uh, here's a, a, a Gonzo independent work, a, a Crystal Warrior Keisha. Pretty simple. These are all its elements. Um, but there are lots of novel forms. When we scrape um, uh, fan fiction archives, we find people within fan fiction archives writing interactive stories. Uh, and they use all kinds of different forms to do it, but here's just an example. I think this is taken from the Star Trek fandom. Oh no, Pirates of the Caribbean. And this is the structure of this work. So we could already say that First, this is a very, very, very unusual structure. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know that, but believe me, after you've mapped about 5,000 of them, you know what looks weird. Um, but interactively, you might say, oh, well, I expect a set of choices that I make to spread out, like a fan or a tree. But no, um, it's uh, spread, connect, spread, connect, spread, connect, spread, connect, and it uh, shares a structural similarity to that um, uh, uh, Keisha story we saw earlier. Uh, here's an old uh, Choose Your Own Adventure book, uh, Find Your Fate, uh, that uses stitching. And an experimental magazine article from the mid-20th century um, that actually lets you navigate a kind of a grid of poetic choices. So all of these things may look different. We have at UC Santa Barbara a huge collection, the Cats collection, um, uh, which actually uh, goes back to the 1950s, and, and as I mentioned, is in many languages, predominantly English and Romance languages, um, French, Spanish, Italian. Um, but what we're doing is trying to take every single one of these objects and turn it into one of these. Registered, annotated, searchable, describable. How deep is it? How large is it? How many choices are there? Does it merge, or does it always branch? Are there any endings that you cannot get to? Uh, Easter eggs or hidden or secret or broken passages? What about circles or loops? And so all of the, um, these are directed graphs. Um, I'll uh, just say that there's a graduate and undergraduate team that's been working on this for quite a while and sometimes classes and um, uh, summer research groups of uh, UCSB undergraduates participate in collecting uh, sets of new acquisitions from new authors um, both uh, digital and print, and then encoding them into data, rendering them, and adding them to our corpus. So we've been talking a little bit about the big picture here, and you can sort of see that if you want your big picture to be truly big, you start to say, well, what are all the different things, all the different tools I could use to make this out of, all the different mediums there could be in, all the different things. I mean, is anything in Disneyland a branching narrative, right? 
Uh, is there anything from the 15 or 1600s that we could describe as a branching narrative? In other words, in some ways, as we define our object of study through the set of objects that our tools can describe, while we're developing those tools, we're also developing a theory of a genre. And this particular theory of a genre I've described to you just now has certain characteristics. It doesn't actually care what medium it's in. Is it electronic? Is it paper? Who cares, right? What are the choices? What are the shapes of the choices? As long as it can be turned into a rendering that looks like this, then we can ask questions of it. People have been doing this for a long time. The very first work we have, I mentioned written in the late 1920s and published in the early 30s, um, has these kinds of diagrams printed in the interchapters. So people have been thinking in graphs. If you pick up a Choose Your Own Adventure story today, you'll probably find something like this on the back cover of the flyleaf. That's a long time for people to be thinking in graphs about stories. So what is a car contribution? We didn't invent this. We invented a way of taking the concept of the pages laid out as a structure or the chapters of the video game, or the moments of dialogue, and we developed a set of cross-platform tools, a set of data standards, and then a set of rendering rules, and eventually a, a live editor that allows you, while you are typing in an interactive work through an encoding, um, to watch the graph grow and change as it's built in real time from the data you're collecting. Could you draw these in Illustrator? Yes, but our goal is to create an atlas, so we need to encode all our information and be able to re-render it uh, at the speed of now as we are working on it. I'll just say one more thing about this as we're coming to the end of time, which is that um, even if we're working with forms that are not amenable to this kind of collection, this is an example of the interactive film, Twas the Devil, uh, which is uh, completely hosted on YouTube. And you, you navigate between different sections of the film by clicking. Um, even if, if we create an archival copy where we take all of these clips and reassemble them in tools such as H5P, then still that structure, in order to be queryable, annotatable, and comparable to anything else, needs to be in something like the atlas. Otherwise, all of these forms across all these media will be separate, and what we want to do is bring them together to increase our knowledge of them. Thank you. <laughs>